these are the yellow and the red uh, signals, and just by eyes, without any kind of statistical analysis, you see here that they are uh, extremely uh, synchronized. On the other hand, if you contrast this with the action or with the level of activity in another region, for example, in LPS, then you see exactly the contrary. That it's not part of this correlation, or even in this case, it looks like, like a, a, as it could be even anti -correlation. So, and the fourth idea was trying to imagine why under the resin we have this very particular type of structuration of the noise. Noise, as I mean, I, I am a physicist, so I would uh, expect that in the ground state of the brain, I, I should have noise. Why the hell I have something else? So, we try to understand that. Uh, and if there is uh, something uh, uh, useful of this activity for, for cognitive. So this is the main problem I'm trying to address. And of course, I will concentrate uh, today, just for time reason, only on humans and only on fMRI. But as you can imagine, we can do this uh, with animals and with different type of techniques. Also, microscopic techniques, like, for example, local potential, optical imaging, and so on. So the, my second introductory, I don't know why it is not working, but uh, my second um, introductory uh, slide is also uh, an experimental evidence that somehow suggested the first type of very informal type, um, very simple in sense of uh, type of model, uh, which I think is valid. I mean, of course, very incomplete because it's just in intuitive, but I think we will get the right intuition with that. This is a, a from, uh, Corveta lab where they investigated for the first time inside activity in the monkey, it uh, was an anesthetized monkey, not an anesthetized. And what you see here is one of those resistive networks. So it's continuous uh, uh, correlation. In this case, it's a network which is called visual motor resistive network. Then the, the monkey was awake and was performing the visual motor task. And what you see is OPLA, exactly the same type of network. So then you see that all these resistive networks that we see show this uh, strong. Uh, fluctuating correlations and the resin cell conditions in reality have a name because it has a name because we, we have seen or people have seen all these networks before under task conditions. This is a typical example of one of that. And the third is uh, really the suggestion of a first type of model. What is shown here is for those regions involved in this visual motor type of resin state network, what we see is the anatomical connection. So the structure, the underlying structure. And that you see is also astonishing, astonishing uh, overlapping. So that the first intuition was, of course, I have nodes everywhere in the brain. Uh, this is clear because I have uh, asynchronous uh, stochastic neurons uh, that they are doing nothing particular. So it's the, the spontaneous state that we see in the neurophysiology. Uh, and uh, now I start to couple them with some uh, structural information. And of course, then the structure will start to introduce some correlations between all these regions. And this intuition is true. The problem is that it's not so trivial, because that will happen under a very particular dynamical conditions. And this is what we will analyze in the first part of the talk. So for doing this, we, do, uh, we, we use exactly the same strategy as Petra presented. So uh, we have to put this in the framework of the model, the model based what imposes that in each node, in each cortical area that we will simulate, we put a very simple model, and in my case will be really extremely simple, is just a spontaneous model of a spike in activity, as we know very well since the papers of Brunel and Wang and Amit and Brunel and so on. So that's asynchronous, low level of spike in activity around 3 Hz, nothing more. And we put these noisy models in each cortical area, and then we start to couple, to couple those uh, different cortical areas through the uh, DTI, tractography-based uh, structural anatomical matrix. And then we see that by, by this coupling, which kind of dynamic emerge. And of course, what we would like to get is that, that the dynamic that emerge from this model is somehow the dynamic that we observe functionally uh, at the level of fMRI. 
But of course, the, 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 the main goal is not to fit this, because we are sure that we can fit. I mean, come on, we, we, are, we are experts on that. I mean, we can fit whatever you want. Uh, 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 the, the problem is that by doing the fitting, we should learn something. Uh, and, and I will try to convince that, uh, that by using this uh, type of very simple models, in fact, we learn something. So, uh, the model, as I said, uh, just to give you a, a cartoon. Can you say how to recycle the functional point of view? Is that just correlation between the signal and the In the model, you mean? No, in the data, like, would you say? We so, have in the data, you, so you have the signals, the ball signals, in two areas, uh, which are parcelated, so they are relatively big areas, but you can do also at the voxel level, so it's not a problem. This case is par parcelated in. 66 areas. Uh, so you have the signal. Of course, you do all the removal of the physiological underlying signal and so on, so that you try to have the best neuronal signals. And then you just do the correlations between those signals, nothing more. So the functional connectivity is nothing more than the correlation matrix between the ball signals. And you do exactly, of course, the same in the model. In this case, uh, that what I'm presenting here is 66 areas. In general, that depends on the parcellation that we use. We use uh, usually the Hackman parcellation with 66 areas. If we include subcortical areas, uh, we go to 100. If we use other standard parcellation, we go to 120. Now we started to use the, the voxel label, and then we go until 1,000 areas. And then we can still do the calculation for that. Exactly. Okay, I'm coming to that. We don't have any idea about the strength. We know the number of fibers that goes, and this is somehow a weighting if there is only one fiber or a thousand fibers, but we don't have any idea about the scaling. And therefore, I'm trying to explain with this cartoon what is the main problem that we try to solve. In this case, we have only one parameter. And this parameter is exactly that information the scaling, so which is, and we assume that there is only one scaling, so we assume that all the fibers have the same degree of conductivity, if you want. It's a simplification, it's clear, but uh, let us assume that. And we have only one parameter, and then the parameter is this parameter, the scaling parameter, so the strength of the coupling that will scale this uh, density of, uh, of fibers. And what uh, we see here, just uh, again with intuition, is that if this is is zero, basically you are multiplying all, all the DTI information on the tracks by zero, so what you have is just disconnected uh, spontaneous reactivity. And that by definition, because we have noise, are disconnected noise, so that is what we expected to have before we have done all these measurements. So just uncorrelated, spatially and temporally uncorrelated noise everywhere. But this is not what the brain shows us. So when we try now to increase this capital, so that we say, okay, the, the structure has half a role, all these things, is shaping the correlation. So let's see how, how it's shaping. And then the only parameter that we have is we try to increase this control parameter. And by doing this, we see that this, this, this uh, spontaneous track that was in the disconnected case is, is, is stable for a long time until a point which we call a bifurcation point where this state disappears, and then many other possible states disappear, uh, appears. And then the question is, in which position of, the, of, this, uh, of this scaling is the brain working uh, at rest? We know that it's not here because it's unrealistic. Probably it's also not here because at some point the, the, the brain gets epileptic. So it's somewhere here. But where? Because if we identify where we get the best fitting, perhaps we can interpret what's going on from a mechanistic point of view. And this is what we have done. So we put at the level of spiking neurons and we do spiking simulations, uh, taking the model of uh, Brunel and Wang, so with excitatory and inhibitory neurons, uh, uh, conductance, uh, conductance basic model with uh, synaptic uh, described by AMPA and MBA and GABA and so on, and we couple all these different spontaneous state pieces with the structural connectivity. And what we hope is that for a given strength of this connectivity, the resting state emerge uh, from the whole system. In order to, to simplify, and because 
we would like to understand the model, what we do is we simplify the model also in parallel and we do the mean field reduction. Actually, we use the one proposed by or a variation of the one proposed by Wong and Wang, where we simplify the number of equations. And even by doing this, we uh, we end up with an analytical expression of the functional connectivity. So that we even avoid the, the, the explicit calculation of all the stochastic, uh, the, sto uh, the, the stochastic simulations for, for, for uh, getting information about that correlation. But so we get a, an exact value of the functional connectivity. Okay, this is just a technical detail. Uh, these are the equations. Here is just to show you that both models work very well. So this is the bifurcation diagram. So I was showing uh, you before in a cartoon. This is how the real one obtained with the full lighting simulations. This is obtained with the different model, which were adjusted so that we have the main, the main, uh, the main bifurcations. Actually, the bifurcation what does matter is one. This is the resting state. So actually, most of the cortical areas are down down 3 hertz or a little bit more, below 10 hertz, let's say. And then at some point, they start to build up the attractors. I am just plotting here the maximum value because there are more than one attractors. And here, the important thing is that the state loses stability in both models. And, and, and we will see here that it's exactly the bifurcation where, so, and this is regulated again by the scaling coupling strength parameter. And now we test we, how well is the fitting between the empirical functional connectivity and the simulated uh, emerged functional connectivity is plotted here for the spiking model and for the dynamic mean field model. And what you see is that this value is maximum is the correlation between the two uh, functional correlation matrix. So the, the bigger, the better, the larger, the better. And we see that this maximum is reached just at the brink, at the edge of that bifurcation where the spontaneous state loses stability. And now we can interpret this, and, and I will do this at the end of the talk. This is just to show you that these are the functional connectivity matrix, because it's matrix, I just got uh, half of them. One is the empirical, uh, so the yellowish, and the blue one is the uh, simulated one. And what you see is that this, you understand why this system is so good. So the, the, it looks really similar. Uh, with both models, uh, and this is just the scatter plots of the different pairs uh, correlations. The, uh, so the, um, the empirical and the simulated, and what you see, that's, that is the same tendency to go hand by hand. Okay, the problem, uh, okay, we can, we can, how I'm doing? Uh, um, this is just to show an example about how good, but also how wrong our intuition was. This is for, the, for a given seed, for example, the FTC, uh, the structural connectivity matrix. So the anatomical connection of this guy with the rest of the cortex. These are my 66 areas. And what you see is that this guy is connected with this, 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 and this. This is the empirical functional connectivity. So what you see is, of course, this is shaped in this, but it's not fully explained in this. Uh, so therefore, this is in physics, it's trivial. Uh, Function is not equal to structure. Structure uh, shapes a function, but it's not exactly the same. And therefore, you need a model. I mean, if, if, if they would be the same, then you don't need a model for that. And of course, by doing the different type of models, uh, we are able to reproduce this function connectivity with different things. So the main point in my talk, uh, in reality, is okay. I, I followed that intuition. Uh, with different versions of the model. And the intuition was I have neuronal noise as simple as possible. I couple this through the structural connectivity matrix, and therefore I am able, in a very particular working point, which is a bifurcation, I am able to introduce explicitly those long range correlations. Fine, I am done. The problem is that now that I have done this, I realize that. By doing this, I destroyed the integrity of the spontaneous state at the microscopic level. Because by coupling the different cortical areas, I introduced an extra excitation that was not in the isolated model. The isolated model uh, is balanced 
And because it's balanced, I have a synchronous state, I don't have correlation between the neurons, and uh, the whole neurons are in a very low activity state. But when I start to couple them in order to introduce the long-range correlation, I start, uh, without wi uh, willing uh, that, uh, I start to destroy the integrity of the spontaneous state. And this is because we break the balance, and we, we introduce the whole correlations at the intra intra node intra cortical in our case uh, label. And we know that, for example, there are many papers, say the, say the one of my favorites, that this level of correlation at the intra cortical level is very very small. And therefore, we want to to, to recover that. So we want to recover the balance states locally in each node, such that we avoid uh, such artifactual correlations, and also we keep the, uh, the, the activity level uh, at low level, so 3 Hz. This is just a simulation showing you, uh, actually it's a repetition of, 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 of one of the uh, results that was shown uh, uh, by Brunel and Wang uh, in the networks, if you use like in simulations and you uh, and if you tune the, the parameters here such that you have practically a balanced condition actually it should be a slightly inhibitory so that you get asynchronous low activity so this is the rate this is the level of correlation this is the balance the, between excitatory and inhibitory input so here the, the word is okay if you start to introduce now extra extra uh, excitation in this case I do just through the recurrence but in the in the reality in the network happens because of the coupling with the other with the other nodes then then uh, you, you you break uh, all these things so you break the, the balance you break the correlations you break the rates. so but you can recover that by by compensating the level of inhibition locally such that you maintain this balance uh, slightly inhibitory, whatever external inhibition is. And by doing this, then you recover uh, an acceptable level of low correlation at the intracortical level, and of course, a low level of uh, rate activity at that level. And of course, you can do that at the at spiking level, you can do this at the reduced dynamic minute level. The advantage is that here you can do this analytically, so you don't need to, 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 to do this uh, numerically. So we, we found a way of really adjusting each single feedback inhibition in each single cortical area in a way that at the end of the day we know that uh, the system is absolute. And this is exactly what we do, so uh, because we break the balance by introducing the real structural connectivity, then we compensate that by adjusting independently because it depends on the external connection in each node and its difference for each node. So therefore, we have to do this independently and uh, recover the balance. So that at the end of the day, the connected uh, network is uh, still uh, in that spontaneous state where I have low activity and low correlation at the intranode layer. We do this, as I said, with both models. And this is the result what you get. And this is very interesting. So let us concentrate on the, on the black uh, curves. This is the result that I have shown you before. Uh, basically, this is the non-balanced case, so the, the dotted black curve. Here was the bifurcation, so we got the best fitting between empirical and simulated FC at the edge of the bifurcation, so around this region. But now when you balance, you shift the bifurcation, uh, and you get again that's the best fitting is around this bifurcation, but there are many advantages in the balanced version. The first advantage is that it's not so fine tuning as in the non-balanced case. So as you, if you see here that the region where you have a good fitting of the reality is relatively narrow around the bifurcation. Here is much broader. And that means that uh, uh, we gain in robusticity. The quality of the fitting it's much better, not only here quantitatively, that we, the, the Pearson correlation between the functional correlations is much better here and here, which is, but the, the quality and the comparison between the matrices and, uh, and the scatter plots looks much better. Uh, furthermore, uh, if you check how good is the, the, the fitting of the modes 
of the dynamics, meaning, for example, the PCAs, uh, the, the, we checked the, the, the first four PCAs, which somehow reduced the dynamics. And what we get is also, again, that the balance explanation of those modes is much better than the non-balance explanation of those modes. So that meaning that by, by fulfilling this, uh, this uh, biological constraint uh, was useful from a computational point of view. The picture didn't change. So the, 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 we still work at the edge of the bifurcation, but in a much better and robust way. The main advantage of this uh, balancing is obtained when we try to use the resting state model for uh, explaining task activity, because this is the real thing. Uh, and, okay, I, okay, uh, and, and this can be simulated, for example, here, you, in the model, you introduce an external exogenous input, uh, simulating some visual simulation, and then you observe what happened with the 66 area. And this is a non-balanced case, and this is the balanced case. And that's, you see here, just by eye, and we will see now in a more rigorous way with information theoretical tools, but just by eye you see that here there is somehow a, a sick tendency to, to drive many of the, of the nodes uh, uh, high. Actually, the nodes which are driven uh, uh, very high are uh, Randy Martin is fine. <laughs> uh, is, um, uh, are the hubs, the hubs of the networks. And the hubs of the network are members of the default mode network. And the members of the default mode network, on the contrary, they are suppressed during task conditions. So that, that, that is unrealistic. And if you see what happens when you use a balanced network, then you have a much cleaner uh, pattern, uh, evoking pattern of activity. You can do this more elegantly, and we have done this. So we simulated 1,000 different tasks randomly. So just put in exogenous, uh, random exogenous inputs to different cortical areas. Uh, and here you compare for all the areas how they are excited. Uh, so the, the, the average evoked activity under these 1,000 different uh, situations. So in dark red or in dark uh, blue are the members of the domain. So they are the most excited, but for the unbalanced, they are much more excited than for the blue. So in fact, that now we can quantify this uh, from, from an information theoretical point of view. So we can calculate the total entropy able to be expressed by this system, and how much of this entropy is in fact reduced by all these thousand trials. So by calculating the amount of entropy that is reduced, uh, we see how well the network is expressing all these patterns. And what we see is that in the balance case has a much larger, I call that information capacity. So it's able to express in a much richer way uh, uh, many, many uh, different type of tasks. Uh, just one transparency more and I finish. This is just to, 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 to give you the take home message and, and to come with an explanation. I mean, by using these very simple models, uh, and I agree with uh, Matteo's remarks, uh, uh, in this case, uh, everything was reduced to one parameter. And I think that by doing this, we learn a lot, because we learn, besides of the necessity of balance, but with or without balance, we, we learn that we need to work at the edge of the bifurcation, which is what I was showing you before. I put here just a landscape so that you get a feeling of what's going on. So this is the coupling strength, so this control parameter. So at, at the beginning, you have only one spontaneous state. This was the trivial, uncorrelated noise everywhere. Uh, at some point, a new state will start to, to appear. These are cognitive states, if you want. Uh, and at some point, the spontaneous state loses stability. So for some reason, we know, because this is what the experiments are showing us, the best fitting is here. And the best fitting is here uh, for some reason. And then we try to understand that reason. And we can understand this by doing these task simulations. If we work here, near the bifurcation, or if we work here, very far away from the bifurcation, the big advantage is that here, with the gentle external inputs, we are very rapid 
uh, very efficiently in the tractor. And this is an ecological advantage. If we are far away, of course, for going beyond the bifurcation to the cognitive attractors where I need to be in order to process something, I need not only a major effort, so larger input, but also if I manage to do that, and that is this point, uh, what I need is much more time. So therefore, it's much more, and, and this is a lucky business. Eh? Uh, so the system decided to be there at the edge of the bifurcation. Why? Because it's optimally for tasks. And for us, uh, uh, I said it was a, a lucky casualty because that gives us the opportunity by just looking at the correlations to get a full uh, picture of the cognitive capabilities of the system. Of course, uh, the biology group have designed the system to work here and say, well, you need more inputs. It's your problem. I put you bigger inputs, but, but the system would work. But biology decided to work here, and because it's working here, the noise, or better, the correlations in the noise is, by casualty, a window in the cognitive capabilities uh, of the system, and is extremely uh, informative. I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Alex. Uh, so I thought that um, the resting state only involved some of the areas uh, of the brain. So those appear, according to your analysis, to be on the, on the edge of that bifurcation. But how about all the other areas that are not part of the resting states? Do you think they, uh, they live in kind of a low, spontaneous state with not much no. happening? Or, because it doesn't seem to apply to all the areas. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to get at. No, well, the, as you know, at least in the human, uh, most of the areas, even subcortical, which are, were not shown here, are part of at least one resting state network. So they are like, uh, depending on the methodology, but let's say in the human uh, discussion nowadays, about five to nine different types of resting state networks. And the cortical areas are in some of these resting state networks. There could be a seal, I mean, I, I, to be honest with you, I don't know. There could be that there are some minor areas that perhaps, because they are pretty much isolated from the structural point of view, that they are not part of any network. So then what the model would say is that that area is just, uh, is just usually under resting state condition, it's spiking in a fully uncorrelated way, and nothing more. But most of the areas are really involved in, the, in, one, of, in one of the resting states, at least. Yeah. No, uh, that's a good question. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I didn't say it. So it's an excellent question. No, we decided to, uh, and I think most of the model uh, this, uh, go in that direction, but actually it's, it's an assumption that's, as most assumptions probably <laughs> fall, uh, to, uh, to consider only excitatory, excitatory connections. Uh, but of course we know, especially if you involve uh, subcortical areas, we know that there are some tracks that uh, are impinging on inhibitory connections. So th that is a totally new open field. The problem is that we don't have that information. Uh, I mean, in the COCOMAC, we know that all the extracted COCOMAC information, for example, are glutamatergic. But we don't know if these glutamatergic are impinging on inhibitory also. So it's, it's, it's also a simplification. So I, I believe that there are, of course, many cases where where, uh, where you have that impact on, on inhibitory area. I mean, the good news is that from the point of view of the model, it's not a problem at all. Uh, even now that we have uh, an analytical solution for that, we can allow now those connections to be negative or to impact on the, on the inhibition and, and see if there are a better explanation of the resting state. But, but we don't know if that is anatomical, realistic enough, but uh, it's too late. Uh, people are a bit puzzled about exactly how the balancing, exactly what goes on the balancing. So after you introduce the balancing, within one node, they're, they're, they're uncorrelated. Yeah. Well, so that means that the average activity of that entire node is now constant, right? Yeah. So, so why 
why then would you even get fluctuations in the bond signal from that low? From yeah, low? that's fundamental, actually. Uh, no, you, you, of, of, so the mean activity is now in all nodes after the balance uh, really in the model is uh, it's exact around three hertz. So I put all the mean activity in three hertz. But of course you have, especially in this type of model, for example, a finite size nodes. So you have uh, you have a Poissonian kind of uh, of noisy activity at the spiking level. So so you move around the the, the three hertz. So you have noise. And what, uh, what is the resting state? The resting state is not that the activity goes up and down, as people believe it perhaps before. It's that the noise fills the correlations. And this is what we call resting state. So the functional connectivity and the task condition, the functional connectivity get correlations because this area and these areas, they go to 40 hertz, and then they are correlated. In the resting state, because we are at the brink of the bifurcation, these areas and these areas are uh, in three hertz, but the way how the noise uh, fluctuates is correlated. And we, and, we can, and we can, therefore I say, it's a window to the cognitive level without going to the cognitive level. Just by reading how the noise here correlates, I know that ah, this guy will have, under some circumstances, the tendency to go up. But that noise correlation isn't present within the level. But not between uh, within the node. It's between node, but not within nodes. I always have problems in English with this. <laughs> so intracortical, there's no correlation. Uh, long range, there are correlations. The timescale of those fluctuations are dictated by the microchip. The timescale of the fluctuations is just the timescale for getting an isolated circuit. That's an excellent question. Uh, I tried to do a 10 second. Uh, it's important because, uh, as you know, uh, all these uh, correlations, and we know, and was a casualty that people discovered this in fMRI because they discovered this in 0 0.1 hertz, and this is the limit of the fMRI. But nowadays, we know with MEG and EG that, in fact, they are 0 0.1 hertz. So therefore, I say they were lacking. I mean. and, they are, and now we understand why they are 0 0.1 hertz. This is also a very good evidence that the system is working at the edge of the bifurcation. Because as you know, in physics, dynamical systems that start to approach the, 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 the bifurcation slow down. And we can calculate this analytically. We can look now at the eigenvalues of all the modes and we prove that this is really at 0.1 hertz. So the fluctuations are getting slower. 